Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the Brantford Prophecy Day, and also welcome to those who are joining us today by webcast on the internet. We're going to begin by singing together hymn 61, Pray for the Peace of Jerusalem, hymn 61. standing, our brother Frank Cable will open in prayer. O oh, Yahweh, our God, there is none like unto thee. No one else can measure the waters of the earth in the hollow of their hand. No one else can measure the heavens with a span. We come before thee, Heavenly Father, as our God, and we thank thee that you have brought us to this place where with our brethren and sisters we can meet together to think about the work that thou art doing at this present time in the world. For indeed, the set time is about to come when thou wilt favor Zion. And we are so thankful that even amongst so many who would scoff at thy word and turn their back on it, we have the evidence of thy people going back to their land. We have the evidence of the nations of the earth being interested in Jerusalem and being dragged into the conflict which will eventually bring forth thy son. We live in a privileged time, Heavenly Father, and we give thee thanks for it, that we can see so many things happening to enliven our spirit and to help us to be prepared for that day. And truly, we would give thee no rest until thou hast made Jerusalem a joy and a praise in the earth. We are thankful to thee, Heavenly Father, that we can read thy word in our native tongue, that we're not subject to others telling us what it says, but we can read it, we can study it, we can memorize it, we can hold it tenaciously, so that as the winds of the conflict that's all about us blow against us, we will not release our crown. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you would accept of our thanks for the great work that thou hast done in thy Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. 
We thank you so much that as we have read thy word and we have seen what you think about human behavior, that thou art a God of forgiveness and mercy. And we pray that you will look down upon us in mercy and favor us. We pray, Heavenly Father, that we might be able, by the work of our brethren this day, to become more aware of the times in which we live, that our witness to the world about us, of what thy word is saying, of how close we are to the return of thy Son and the great age of righteousness, will awake some to open their Bibles, that they might be able to see that these things are true and appropriate for the day in which we live. We thank thee, therefore, Father, and seek your blessing on all our events. In the name of thy Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. I think most everyone has probably been here before, but if not, note the location of the fire exits. There is one here, and the door is to the right at the back and straight through. And the washrooms are um, down the hallway here where you would have come in from the, the parking lot, both the men's and the women's. On the program, it says that there is classes for children um, in the second and third sessions. In the second session, what will actually be happening is that a question sheet will be provided for any of the children that would like one. And for those who complete it, they'll be given a sweet treat at the end of class two. And then there will be a class for the children in the third session. Just reading from Joel chapter three. For behold, in those days and in that time, when I shall bring again the captivity of Judah and Jerusalem, I will gather all nations and will bring them down into the valley of Jehoshaphat and will plead with them there for my people and my heritage Israel, whom they have scattered among the nations and parted my land. This is our day, brothers and sisters and young people and friends. The vision will not tarry forever but indeed it will come to pass very soon. And so it is good for us to be here together today, to be strengthened and reminded of the certainty of these things that we hold dear and believe together. And so that is the purpose of our coming together today. Our first session this afternoon will be led by our brother Nicholas White from the Pershore UK Ecclesia, and to introduce his class, which is entitled Christadelphians and the Hope of Israel, 1848 to 1948, I've asked Brother Phil Wilton from the Toronto West Ecclesia if he'll please lead us in the reading of Zechariah chapter 10. That's Zechariah chapter 10. Brother Phil. Reading together from the Word of God, the prophecy of Zechariah, chapter 10. Ask ye of the Lord rain in the time of the latter rain, so the Lord shall make bright clouds and give them showers of rain to every one grass in the field. For the idols have spoken vanity, and the diviners have seen a lie, and have told false dreams. They comfort in vain. Therefore, they went their way as a flock. They were troubled because there was no shepherd. Mine anger was kindled against the shepherds, and I punished the goats. For the Lord of hosts hath visited his flock, the house of Judah, and hath made them as his goodly horse in the battle. Out of him came forth the corner. Out of him the nail, out of him the battle bow, out of him every oppressor together. And they shall be as mighty men, which tread down their enemies in the mire of the streets in the battle, 
and they shall fight, because the Lord is with them, and the riders on horses shall be confounded. And I will strengthen the house of Judah, and I will save the house of Joseph, and I will bring them again to place them, for I have mercy upon them, and they shall be as though I had not cast them off, for I am the Lord their God, and will hear them. And they of Ephraim shall be like a mighty man, and their heart shall rejoice as through wine. Yea, their children shall see it and be glad. Their heart shall rejoice in the Lord. I will hiss for them and gather them, for I have redeemed them, and they shall increase as they have increased. And I will sow them among the people, and they shall remember me in far countries, and they shall live with their chil children and turn again. I will bring them again also out of the land of Egypt and gather them out of Assyria, and I will bring them into the land of Gilead and Lebanon, and place shall not be found for them. And he shall pass through the sea with affliction and shall smite the waves in the sea, and all the deeps of the river shall dry up, and the pride of Assyria shall be brought down, and the scepter of Egypt shall depart away. And I will strengthen them in the Lord, and they shall walk up and down in his name, saith the Lord. So once again, our brother Nicholas White will be leading our first class, and his subject is Christadelphians and the Hope of Israel. 1848 to 1948, and we ask him to come and deliver that to us now. My brothers and sisters, it is indeed an honour and a privilege to be here with you today as we share together this wonderful hope. For there is nothing else, is there, in our lives, in this world, that is more important or more wonderful than that which we have come to know and to love as the hope of Israel. It is the hope that the promises that the Almighty gave to the fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac and to Jacob. It is the hope that gladdened David's heart. It is the hope for which the Apostle Paul lay bound in chains. And the Almighty has in his great mercy given us the opportunity to take hold of that hope that it might become ours, that it might be the centre and the motivation of our lives. And as we've already thought together, it is surely not long before the full realisation of that hope is seen in the return of our Lord Jesus and the bringing again of his people finally back into his covenant that they might form the basis of that glorious kingdom which shall spread across the earth. Now, my, my brothers and sisters, what I would like to do this afternoon is just to look back at some of those things that were prophesied and at some of those things that happened. And to start with, to establish the understanding that our early brethren had. I'm sure we, we can all think of Brother Thomas and what he wrote in Elpis Israel, that wonderful book which set out the hope of Israel. And just to start by thinking about those words that are well known to us, where he describes in 1848, doesn't he, the return that he looks for. The truth is there are two stages in the restoration of the Jews. The first is before the Battle of Armageddon and the second after it, but both pre-millennial. 
God has said, I will save the tents of Judah first. This is the first stage of restoration. So he sees two stages in the return of Israel to their land. And he notes there is then a partial and primary restoration of the Jews before the manifestation, that is, of the Lord Jesus. The pre-adventural colonization, the fact that the Jews would go back to establish a colony of some sort before Christ's return, will be on purely political principles. And the Jewish colonists would return in unbelief of the messiahship of the Lord Jesus and of the truth as it is in him. So that the Jews were to return to the land of Israel. And that they were to do so, we note, firstly, in unbelief. It was not that they were to go back initially, said Brother Thomas, from his understanding of Bible prophecy, because they understood that the Lord Jesus was the Messiah, but rather in unbelief, and that it would be a political colonization. And he goes on. They will immigrate thither as agriculturalists and traders, in the hope of ultimately establishing their commonwealth, interestingly, ultimately, but more immediately of getting rich in silver and gold by commerce with India and in cattle and goods under the efficient protection of the British power. So they were to return to trade by agriculture and not as a state, at least initially, and that Britain would be involved in that process of their return. Indeed, I know not, he says, whether the men who at present contrive the foreign policy of Britain entertain the idea of assuming the sovereignty of the Holy Land and of promoting its colonization by the Jews. They will be compelled by events soon to happen to do what, under existing circumstances, heaven and earth combined could not move them to attempt. And it is that certainty of what God has revealed in his word that we share, isn't it? And that we must hang on to. That however unlikely in worldly human terms what God has said will happen, however unlikely it may look, if God has said it, it will happen. Who could have thought when Brother Thomas wrote that a nation so scattered should have been returned to its land. Of course, he was not the only one to say so, but there is a degree of detail in this that we've been considering together. And so we note there, Britain to be compelled to rule Palestine and to encourage them to return, the Jews to return to the land of Israel. And just one more extract before we summarise. This, their expectation, will not be deceived. For before Gog invades their country, as it is described by the prophet as a land of unwalled villages whose inhabitants are at rest and dwell safely, all of them dwelling without walls and having neither bars nor gates, and possessed of silver and gold, cattle and goods dwelling in the midst of the land. And so we could summarise, perhaps, the key things that we've seen together like this. The Jews were to return to Israel. There was to be two stages in their return. Their return was to be a political colonization in unbelief of the Lord Jesus. They were to prosper by trade and agriculture. And then Britain's involvement, Britain to help the Jews to return to the land. They were to live under British protection and Britain was to rule Palestine. Now, it's important we remember the context in which Brother Thomas wrote these words. He said this in 1853, he wrote this, The great cause of misapprehension is the allegorizing method of Oregon. And so he refers back to one of the early church fathers, as, as they're termed, aren't they? And the, the thinking that governed the people of that class, and he calls it an allegorizing. In other words, it's not just a simple, straightforward, thus and so, when the Almighty says it, but, but it has all sorts of other symbolic meanings that might very well preclude the literal application of God's promises. They have construed all those glorious promises of a political restoration 
into nothing more than a spiritual conversion. They claim for the church all the glory of the latter day. The restoration of the Jews to Palestine forms the very keystone to the whole political structure of the world. And this understanding that the promises that God had made to Israel, to God's people, really did apply to them, to be fulfilled in that way, and not to be applied to what was considered the church as people in a spiritual way. That understanding, of course, underpinned the rest of that wonderful hope that our early brothers and sisters came to understand. Would you turn your Bibles with me to Isaiah chapter 11? I just want to look at just a few passages that underline perhaps some of the places from which Brother Thomas took his understanding. We're familiar with this chapter and the first part of it from that wonderful picture that we have of the millennium itself and the reign of the Lord Jesus Christ as the rod out of the stem of Jesse in the early part of the chapter. But if we just go on towards the end in verse 11, it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall set his hand again the second time to recover the remnant of his people which shall be left from Assyria and from Egypt and from Pathros and from Cush and from Elam and from Shinar and from Hamath and from the islands of the sea. And he shall set up an ensign for the nations and shall assemble the outcasts of Israel and gather together the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. Now, it's worth reflecting on this. He talks of a second time. A second time of Israel's return to their land. The first time, of course, was when they returned from Babylon, wasn't it? And there have been those who have tried to talk about the return of Israel and say that it was that return to which the prophets refer. But this is plainly not the case. The remarkable thing about this prophecy is that Isaiah is writing, of course, well before the first return took place. And when you consider the places that the people of Israel are returning from, they are certainly not just returning from Babylon, are they? From all those places ending up with the four corners of the earth. No, this is a return that clearly is far beyond simply the return from Babylon. Now, if we go over to Ezekiel chapter 37 just to see another aspect of this and again this is we're familiar with this chapter as the vision of the dry bones but if we just go on a little beyond that in the second half of the chapter we have a vision of the kingdom with David my servant and we come to verse 16 Moreover, thou son of man, take thee one stick and write upon it for Judah and for the children of Israel, his companions. Then take another stick and write upon it for Joseph and his companions. I'm sorry, for Judah and for the children of Israel, his companions. Then take another stick and write upon it for Joseph, the stick of Ephraim, and for the whole, all the house of Israel, his companions. And join them one to another into one stick and they shall become one in thine hand. And so the prophet Ezekiel is given a vision of two sticks, one Judah and one Joseph. It's worth reflecting on the history of the nation. These two sticks were to become one in the hand. We reflect back on the times after Rehoboam when the nation was divided in two. And we had one in the south and one in the north. And particularly in Hosea, we find these two parts of the nation referred to in these terms. As Judah in the south and Israel in the north being equated with Ephraim and Joseph in the north and Judah in the south. And so it would seem that in fact he's referring here to these two parts of the kingdom. Judah in the south and Joseph or Ephraim in the north. So we have these two parts of the nation then that in some way, or at least two parts, being joined back together. Now it's significant that again he's not talking about the return from Babylon. Verse 25, certainly Zerubbabel was not their prince forever. 
And the temple was not rebuilt forevermore in verse 26. Neither was God with them, ultimately. So this again is pointing forward to a yet future time. It's significant that those returning after that exile from Babylon were referred to as Judah, even though they may have comprised a mixture of nations, of both parts of the nation, of the northern and the southern kingdom. But what the prophetical view is showing us is that those inside the land are referred to as Judah and those scattered as Ephraim or Joseph. So we have a, a sort of typical application regardless of where they actually came from. And so it is that he says this, I will take the stick of Joseph which is in the hand of Ephraim. So we've got the idea here of those Jews who are scattered outside the land and the tribes of Israel his fellows and will put them with him. Those scattered I will put with him with the stick of Judah and will even with the stick of Judah, make them one stick, and they shall be one in mine hand. So clearly you have there the idea of, of the two being joined, but there is perhaps a little more than that. For it is also that they are being, that Judah is already there, and Joseph is being joined to him. This seems to be the, the sense of the verse. As we read later on, I will take the children of Israel from among the heathen, whither they be gone, and bring them on every side, and bring them into their own land, and I will make them one nation upon the mountains of Israel. So when Brother Thomas wrote, there is then a partial and primary restoration of Jews before the manifestation, he's thinking of that which the prophet terms Judah. And that is to serve as the nucleus or basis of future operations in the restoration of the rest of the tribes, which in Ezekiel's vision is referred to as Joseph or Ephraim, being brought together to, what, to that part that was already there in the land. Now we see the same pattern in Zechariah 10 as we read together. Just going to Zechariah chapter 10, and we note in verse 3, Mine anger was kindled against the shepherds, and I punished the goats, for the Lord of hosts hath visited his flock, and you note where he refers to first, the house of Judah, and hath made them as his goodly horse in the battle. So we have a reference first to Judah, very much as we have in Zechariah chapter 12 and verse 7. The Lord also shall save the tents of Judah first. And we read on in verse 6. I will strengthen the house of Judah and I will save the house of Joseph. So again a reference to those of Judah referred to as Judah who were already in the land. And afterwards Joseph, those who have been scattered and those who are still scattered to be brought to him. And I will, verse 8, hiss for them and gather them. So in verses 7 to 10, Ephraim and Joseph, those yet scattered, those still scattered, to be brought together as one with Judah in the land. And so, just to go back to that passage we started with, the truth is there are two stages. The first is before the Battle of Armageddon and the second after it, but both before both pre-millennial, both before the setting up of the kingdom proper. God has said, I will save the tents of Judah first. And perhaps it is that that we have been privileged to see the start of. Isaiah chapter 18 just helps us to fill in another aspect, and I'm just touching on this very briefly. Woe to the land shadowing with wings which is beyond the rivers of Ethiopia that sendeth ambassadors by the sea even in vessels of bulrushes upon the waters. The geography of this passage, wrote Brother Thomas, points to the lion power of Tarshish as to the land shadowing with wings. 
But the British power is still further indicated by the insular position of its seat of government. For the sending of fleet messengers by the sea implies that the shadowing power is an island state. So two aspects. He saw a navy as being a significant part and that it had to be an island, which of course as an island power was critical. And so the understanding that Tarshish fulfilled that role, that Britain fulfilled the role of Tarshish in helping the Jews back to their land was something that Brother Thomas understood. There is one more, however, aspect that we need to just add to this little picture. The power of the Turkish Empire will be dried up or overturned, he wrote. Well, here is a telescope. And, of course, this is the simple outline of the structure of Revelation, isn't it? As each vision opens out from the seals and the trumpets and the vials till ultimately God's purpose is, is, is revealed. Now, if we consider that view... And what we read in Revelation chapter 9, we have the sixth angel which had the trumpet saying, Loose the four angels which are bound in the great river Euphrates. And so the Euphrates comes to represent the territory through which the river ran. Just as the river Nile came to stand for Egypt, the river through which it ran. And Euphrates, of course, goes through Turkey. So just as four angels there are seen as loosed, there are four powers being loosed in that verse, in the symbolic language out of Turkey. So what were they? Well, history tells us that these four powers, the Seljuks, the Mongols of various kinds and the Ottomans, came out and ultimately led to the destruction of Constantinople in 1453. So on the one hand, we have the river Euphrates and the powers of the Turkish Empire being unloosed. And just as a river becomes more powerful and gains greater strength, so it can dry up. And that's the other end of the vision that Revelation 16 gives us. For in the sixth vial, the Euphrates dries up. In the sixth trumpet in chapter 9, it is seen as unloosing the power. In chapter 16, that same power is seen as disappearing. So if this refers to the Turkish Empire then, we would expect to see that power which had such control disappearing. So here's a little view of this chapter, of this idea then, between these two chapters in Revelation. And we're going to work unusually from right to left. I mean, being... I must tell you, I've never been to Canada before. Actually, I've never been out of the UK before. <laughs> so I thought, well, it would be just a little jaunt, you know. Um, but so we go right to left. I mean, I'm still getting the hang of this. I keep going around the wrong side of the car, you know, and waiting and finding that I can get in. But right to left is, of course, the Hebrew method, so that's okay. So we start in chapter 9 with the sixth trumpet and the powers of the... Turkish um, Empire gradually, are, of, of the Muslim power, are released until ultimately, in the sixth vial, the Euphrates dries up. And therefore, it is the end of the Turkish power being predicted. And we'll see the full significance of that in just a minute. What we can do then is to add to our list of seven an eighth aspect, a key aspect, for which our early brothers and sisters were looking, which is for the Turkish power, the political power, to lose its political power. Well, we can, if you like, simplify all of those eight into three. I think three is an easier number to cope with, and that is this. The Jews are to return to the land of Israel. Britain is to assist them in doing so, and the Turkish power is to dry up. So that being so, we now need to look back and see what actually took place. I'm going back to 1855, when, in actual fact, we find this remarkable Jewish philanthropist, Sir Moses Montefiore. He amassed great wealth and was able to retire at the age of 40. It's quite an ambition. But he visited Israel seven times and used, as a very, obviously, very able gentleman, he actually used his wealth to benefit the Jews. 
those poor Jews who were actually there. He was most concerned about how the sort of lives that they were living. Brother Thomas actually wrote to him, Dear and respected sir, deeply sympathising with the poor Jews who are suffering for want of food in the Holy Land, we believe in all the glorious things that are spoken of Zion. And he sends a contribution from those who share with him in this hope in seeing Israel back in their land, an adopted Israelite in Christ. And so Moses responds, I hasten to acknowledge your esteemed favour and valuable enclosure. I prize most highly the expression of your kind sympathy with my suffering co-religionists in the Holy Land. I fervently pray that our Almighty Father may bless with thousandfold the store of those whose hearts yearn towards the land whence the Holy Word went forth. I have the honour to be, dear sir, yours faithfully, Moses Montefiore. Now, he used the wealth that he had to great effect. In 1856, he actually visited Palestine and used the wealth that he had to support those who were there, establishing a hospital, a weaving establishment, a sewing and washing institution, and as you see there. And the lying-in society, I understand, was not something for lazy teenagers, <laughs> but rather for pregnant women. And he built almshouses and a windmill, which is even there today. Now, it was most significant that those who were there, those few Jews who were there, it, it was not the case that anybody else could just go and join them if they wanted to. But in 1856, the Sultan of Turkey actually decreed that Jews could return for the express and limited purpose of agriculture. And Brother Thomas was obviously interested in that too. In 1871, Brother Thomas died, and Brother Roberts then, as editor of the Christadelphian magazine, in 1875, asked for donations to the ongoing effort that was then taking place to support the Jews in the land. And the brothers and sisters responded, and not only sent back money, but their hearts too. I wish to add my might to the, to the blessing of Israel. We have much pleasure in forwarding the enclosed in behalf of our, our beloved country. I am amongst those who long for the prosperity of Zion and therefore send what I can to increase the fund for the Jewish colonization of Palestine, hoping that others will do the same. Here were brothers and sisters who were not rich in this world's goods, but who were rich in faith, who understood the hope that they shared, who longed for the completion of it, who understood the return of the Jews to the land was the necessary beginning for the Lord to return, and who wanted to help it on its way. Now in 1877, Brother Roberts wrote a booklet, a pamphlet, Prophecy and the Eastern Question. And you may just be able to make out there, it says, the exhibition of the light shed by the scriptures of truth on the matters involved in the crisis that has arrived in Eastern affairs. And the, the key parts of this, the approaching fall of the Ottoman Empire. You remember the fall of the Turkish Empire that prevented anybody, just any Jews going to, to Israel and wanting to do just what they wanted. That was going to go. And the settlement of the Jews in Syria the return of the Jews to the land of Israel, under British protectorate. And those are the three key points that we had from that passage in Elpis Israel. So we're now going to demonstrate in 1875 that this is what is beginning to happen, prophecy fulfilling before his eyes. And in that pamphlet, he opened out all those various parts of the prophetic word that he had come to understand. You notice he refers there to Revelation 9 and 16 and what was going to happen to Turkey. The time period is in Daniel, the essential part that Israel had to play in going back to the land and being prosperous from Ezekiel 38 and various other things as well. He wrote this. The one great barrier in the way of all such schemes hitherto to return to the land, has been the uncertainty of life and property in Syria under the Turkish government. 
under British protection, this state of uncertainty would soon vanish, and the formation of a Jewish settlement on the scale required by prophecy would be a matter of a very few years. So Brother Roberts understood that if the Turkish Empire was taken out of the way, if Britain was present and active in supporting the return of the Jews, then that for which he looked would soon take place. Brother Roberts sent this letter, uh, sent the pamphlet with a letter to William Gladstone, who had just finished being the Prime Minister. And I suppose was surprised to receive a letter back from Gladstone. Uh, Sir, says Gladstone, allow me to thank you for your tract, which I shall read with great interest, for I have been struck with the apparent ground for the belief that the state of the East may be treated of in that field where you have been labouring. In other words, there is a correspondence between what is happening in Israel and what you're talking about from the Bible. And Gladstone, who had some understanding of the Bible, could see what Brother Roberts was actually saying. Now, there was an enterprising brother who worked in the newspaper industry who made sure that that letter went everywhere he could possibly get it. And of course, you can imagine a letter from the Prime Minister would have been of interest for one who just ceased being interested. And all the newspapers, many local newspapers, published it. And Brother Roberts said it was the greatest witness to the truth that there had been in his day. Now, you know how remarkable the internet is. And I thought, wouldn't it be amazing, because I don't have access to, obviously, any of those old newspapers, but wouldn't it be amazing if we just did a search and just saw if there was any sort of fossil of that remarkable thing? Perhaps, perhaps in Glasgow there might be an archive of a newspaper or, or, or perhaps down in Cornwall somewhere. But it wasn't in any of those places that I found it. It was in New Zealand. In the archives of a newspaper in New Zealand from 1878, we have perused a remarkable pamphlet published by Mr. Robert Roberts of Birmingham entitled Prophecy and the Eastern Question. It is intended to show that the crisis in the East is an important epoch in the fulfilment of the prophecies in the Old and New Testaments regarding events which are to transpire immediately before the second advent of the Messiah. So there, in essence, is the message. A remarkable pamphlet talking about what was going to happen immediately before the Lord returns. But that is not all. It is not necessary for us to vouch for the accuracy of the statements if we regard them as singular and striking. We find that a copy of the pamphlet was sent to the Honourable Mr Gladstone, who in reply wrote... And repeats the whole letter. And you may just be able to make out at the end there, he says, the newspaper says, we observe that the pamphlet is on sale at Messrs. Wise and Co. A remarkable testimony, a witness to the truth. And it even echoes down to our own day. There's an interesting... I was going to say a footnote. It, it's not quite a footnote, is it? Eliezer ben Yehuda, who is famous for having resurrected the Hebrew language, who went to Israel in the 1880s and who set about reviving a dead language, just as the nation itself was to be regathered. First of all, though, saw that there were two things that were needed. Not only must there be a Hebrew language that people could speak every day, but quite early on in 1879 said that there had to be a return of Israel to the land of Israel. These words are taken from his autobiography from about 1917. In those days it was as if the heavens had suddenly opened and a clear incandescent light flashed before my eyes and a mighty inner voice sounded in my ears the resurrection of Israel on its ancestral soil. Israel in its own land. And that was what he hoped to move forward. Now, Sir Lawrence Oliphant was a very colourful character and a member of the British establishment, as you see, secretary to Lord Elgin of Elgin Marble fame, who was actually an MP, a British MP, for a limited period. He, at one stage, came under the spell of a certain theosophist of 
slightly strange philosophy, but ultimately was committed to the return of Jews to Palestine. He was, he was obsessed with the idea that the Jews had to go back and settled in Haifa in 1872. And Brother Roberts became very aware of him and indeed saw him as a means of distributing money to those Jews who were there. In 1882, uh, he actually forwarded 300 pounds to him for this purpose. And he wrote this letter, Brother Roberts did. In addition to the money, a considerable quantity of articles of clothing has accumulated in the hands of a few lady friends in Birmingham for Jewish use in the Holy Land. The articles have been produced at sewing meetings held for the purpose and are all good, made of substantial fabric and not of charity stuff. I'm, I'm informed by my good wife that stuff there is not, not a sort of a, a throwaway comment. It refers to the fabric itself. But you notice then there is a history of, these aren't Christadelphians, but these, there is a history of sewing classes supporting Israel then, going all the way back to the 1880s within our community. And these collections forwarded the work of such colonies as Zikron Yaakov and others, which even today exists. In fact, there were annual collections taken up for the return of these Jews and for the Jewish colonization, uh, the Jewish Palestine colonization movement. In fact, in 1888, Brother Roberts met Lawrence Oliphant at the office of the magazine in Birmingham, together with William G., who was a smallholder in this country and a seed collector. And they talked about what they could do to send out seeds and to promote the development of prosperity in the land of Israel for the Jews. In actual fact, I'm sorry, it was Vickers Collier who was involved in seed collecting and William G., who was very much into uh, market gardening and bees. And so during the 1880s, agriculture began to take place in the land of Israel. And Lawrence Oliphant was active. And it really looked for a time as though all those promises for which Brother Roberts had been waiting to see the fulfilment and, and all of those, that work that has been taking place was really about to come to its fulfilment until at a stroke in December 1888, Lawrence Oliphant died. It coincided with a number of other unfortunate events in the life of Brother Roberts, which made it a very trying time. And it must have seemed that things were bleak indeed. It's worth reflecting that were it, were it not for people like Lawrence Oliphant and for donation, donators such as Montefiore, that the Jews who were there would have struggled to survive just the beginnings of what we can see today as the state of Israel. Back in this country, in 1893, Brother Roberts organised some meetings. I say this country, I'm sorry, back in Birmingham, the United <laughs> Kingdom. <laughs> you can blame the jet lag for that. He actually organised meetings in Birmingham Town Hall and he invited the public to come along to find out what had happened to that wonderful promise that he had been tracing through now for all these years since he had read and understood that book, The Hope of Israel. So in these City Hall lectures, he talked about the return of the Jews, the prophecies of Isaiah chapter 40 that Tarshish would help the Jews to return to their land. And he spoke of the wonderful things that he had already seen happening. Look at the state of the Turkish Empire. Once it was the terror of Europe, it sent forth hordes of fanatical horsemen who swept over Europe like a deluge and threatened to inundate the whole of Christendom. And compared to 1848, although that map is slightly in advance of when Brother Roberts wrote, but nonetheless, Turkey had indeed shrunk. It was now, for a while, had been referred to as the sick man of Europe. And there was then, indeed, some considerable evidence of points one and three in our prophetic programme. The Jews had begun to return. There was support for them doing so. And Turkey was certainly showing signs of beginning to dry up. And then in 1896, Herzl wrote his famous pamphlet, The Jewish State, We've referred already to Eliezer ben Yehuda, who had, in fact, started the ball rolling, but it was Herzl's political acumen, if nothing else, 
which made certain that now this issue would not be dropped. The idea which I have developed in this pamphlet is a very old one, the restoration of the Jewish state. The earth resounds with the outcries of the Jews and their outcries have awakened the slumbering idea. Of course, I say it was his political acumen. That was how he perhaps saw it. But there were others, of course, our brethren and sisters who understood. Brother Roberts died the following year in 1898, but understood that this was a very significant development that Herzl was taking forward. Now, in 1901, brother and sister Frank Janoway journeyed to the land of Israel, accompanied with brother C.C. Walker. And there they toured the land and wrote accounts of everything that they'd seen in the Christadelphian magazine in a series to Jerusalem and back. And now the brothers and sisters who had this hope could actually see the, the accounts from one of their own of what was happening in the land of Israel, what life was like for those people of, of God who were there, the people of Israel. Meanwhile, two views were developing in the Zionist movement. Herzl himself was amongst those who said, well, as long as the Jews have somewhere to go, if, if it didn't actually have to be Israel, because that was proving difficult, it could be somewhere else. And others who said, no, it has to be Eretz Israel. It has to be the land of Israel that was promised to Abraham. And the Zionist conflict, con con Congress, certainly was interested in that. Herzl in 1904 actually went to see the Pope to ask him for support for the idea that the Jews should return. We cannot prevent the Jews from going to Jerusalem, but we can never sanction it. The Jews have not recognized our Lord, therefore we cannot recognize the Jewish people. If you come to Palestine and settle your people there, we will have churches and priests ready to baptize all of you. <laughs> it starts off intending to sound like salvation and ends up like a threat, doesn't it? So the Zionist Congress at Baal in 1903 was split between these two wings of the Zionist movement, those who saw it had to be Israel and those who said it could be somewhere else. And perhaps significantly, Herzl died in 1904. And others who were committed to the idea that it had to be Israel took forward that leadership. Hein Weizmann was born in 1872 in Russia and ultimately became a leader in his local Zionist organization. But he ended up in Manchester at university and as a chemist was involved in studying all sorts of things. He was also involved in the Zionists in his local area and through that means came into contact with Arthur Balfour. During the 1906 campaign, he had quite a discussion with Balfour, who it was said was not actually a very good politician. He was rather too interested in other things than politics, as a result of which he actually lost that election. But perhaps he gained something much more important. For famously, there was a discussion between Weizmann and Arthur Balfour, wherein Balfour said to Weizmann, well, why is it that you are so insistent that Jerusalem has to be the place and Israel and Palestine, the place to which you have to return. And Weizmann says, supposing I was to offer you Paris instead of London to be your capital. And Balfour said, yeah, but we have London. And Weizmann said, yes, but we had Israel when London was a marsh. <laughs> and so it perhaps sowed a seed in Balfour's mind that was to bear fruit in later years. Well, we touched earlier on Brother Janoway, who had gone out to the land of Israel, and he made several visits and wrote in 1912 in the Christadelphian magazine, Jewish colonies have greatly multiplied in the suburbs of Jerusalem. Each one of these little colonies is in evidence that when Ezekiel penned his prophecies, he made no false claim in saying, thus saith the Lord, for here we are, walking about in unwalled villages, talking with the people brought out of the nations. In fact, he made four visits and published accounts and photographs in the magazine. In 1914, he published his book, Palestine and the Jews, in which he showed that the Zionist movement 
was an evidence that the Messiah will soon appear in Jerusalem to rule the whole world therefrom. He went all over Israel and listed all the colonies and how many there were in each. And the brothers and sisters could see the developing shape of these people returning to their land, just as God had said. During the First World War, Brother Walker could see the significance of the events that were taking place. By this stage, something called the Jewish Colonial Trust had been established to take donations from all over the country for the people of the Jews in the land. This was a non-Christadelphian charity to which the brother had contributed. And they did so through the war. Now here is, this is just what I've been able to find from the reports of donations that were given in the magazine. So these aren't, as somebody pointed out, it's not adjusted for inflation, so we can't hang too much on it. But just in terms of the amounts that were actually given and revealed in the magazine, you see that they peak there in 1916, at the very height of the war. This was the evidence of our community's concern for the people of Israel in the land. And as you see there, the continuing support for them. Brother Walker wrote about that First World War. Armageddon is preceded by colonization of Palestine by Jews of sufficient importance to provoke the desires of the King of the North to take a spoil. And there we are back with Ezekiel 38, which right from the beginning was seen as a key passage. Israel had to be in their land. They have to be prosperous for the northern invader to come down and invade. And now here they were on the very brink of circumstances that would lead significantly to that happening. By this time, Heim Weizmann, now involved in university work in Manchester, investigating rubber development, quite by accident, or so it would appear from a human perspective, discovered acetone. The power of explosive force at the very time when Britain needed it most was now in the hands of a Jew. And with what power he could now use to further God's purpose. By 1916 he developed acetone and he had discussions with key figures, including Lloyd George and the aforementioned Arthur Balfour. By this time, Balfour had become a committed Zionist and, indeed, had all sorts of discussions with Lord Rothschild, the leader of the Jewish community in Great Britain, which led, ultimately, to the giving of the Balfour Declaration in 1917. This Lord Rothschild was, in fact, something of an eccentric. He was, in fact, the first Jewish peer to sit in the House of Lords, which was a sign in itself. And yes, he had an estate where he did all sorts of extraordinary things like ride tortoises and have carriages pulled by zebras. But more significant and important than that was what the Balfour Declaration said. This is what the government of the day said. His Majesty's government view with favour the establishment in Palestine of a national home for the Jewish people and will use their best endeavours to facilitate the achievement of this object. Now, we know that subsequently this has been a matter of some dispute, but the fact remains that it was the expression of the wish of the British government. And how remarkable it was that Weizmann had discovered acetone at just the right point and had been in touch with Balfour at just the right time to be able to influence the British government. The angels must have been working hard, wasn't they, in all the circumstances leading up to that event. You can imagine the response that there was amongst the brothers and sisters. Writing in the Christadelphian, Brother Ladson said, there would be few ecclesias where on the Sunday morning following the declaration, the theme would not be joyfully enlarged upon and the whole service in prayers, hymns and anthems be warmly touched with the emotion generated by such a vindication of our faith. They had been waiting since at least 1848 for the sign that Britain would support the return of the Jewish people to Israel. But this was not the only thing to happen in those remarkable months. The British government had commissioned General Edmund Allenby to liberate Jerusalem from the Turkish power. And he was charged with doing it 
by Christmas of that year. And Allenby, who read his Bible every day, walked into Jerusalem during the Feast of Hanukkah. It was explicit British uh, support in November that the Jews should go back, and in December, Jerusalem had been freed. Remarkable times indeed. And the prophecies to which our brothers and sisters had looked were beginning to become fulfilled before their eyes. Now, this is a copy of the December or is it the January uh, 1918, January 1918 Christadelphia magazine, in which Brother Walker makes reference to that which had happened. The foregoing was cut short by the necessity of turning out tired and depressed to attend an arranging meeting. I'm sure a, a concept that none of us can sympathise with. The, the first thing that greeted us was the lighting up of the black winter night sky by a tremendous crimson glare from the southeast munition works on fire, as it turned out. The next thing that greeted our ears was the newsboy shout of Jerusalem, Jerusalem taken by the British, enough to stir dry bones, surely. And so this morning, December 11th, the very last moment of writing, the newspaper comes out with a cross-page heading, Jerusalem delivered. And so our brothers and sisters saw what was happening and understood. Now, who are this very quaint English couple and why are they on the screen? They are my mother's grandparents. Brother Archie, during the 1920s, went about the southwest of England and gave talks about what the mandate means. And I found some notes of his address, just a couple of paragraphs. Five weeks after declaration was published, Jerusalem was taken by General Allenby, and the long reign of Turkish misrule and desolating tyranny was ended. Great joy throughout Jewry, and there was profound gratitude and thanksgiving to God from Christadelphians in all parts of the world. We shall not soon forget the thoughts and feelings aroused when on opening our morning papers we read in huge type, Jerusalem free. Why were we so moved? Because Jesus had declared, Luke 21, that Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. Now, clearly, time has gone on. And there is more about that passage that was yet to come. But nonetheless, brothers and sisters understood the times in which they lived and rejoiced in it. Britain administered the area until 1920 when at that conference in San Remo, Britain was appointed as the mandatory power. And a large area under the mandate was, was analysed clause by clause in the Christadelphia magazine. In real, there were in North Wales, there was a special lecture and 180 visitors attended to find out what it was all about. Now, this is a picture of Brother Roberts and his immediate family. Sister Eusebia Firth, his daughter, married Brother Firth in Australia. And when the Prince of Wales visited, she reminded him of something. Much earlier, Queen Victoria had famously said... How I wish that the Lord would come during my lifetime because I should so love to lay my crown at his feet. And when the Prince of Wales went to Australia, Sister Eusebia made sure she was right at the front of the queue where he was going to pass by. And she had in her hand a letter and which referred back to what Queen Victoria had said and included these statements. The British protectorate over the land of Palestine, encouraging the Jews to return and form themselves into a nation in their own land, is a powerful sign that the coming of their king, Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews, is drawing nigh to accomplish all that the prophets have spoken. A witness in high places, indeed. Heimweizmann understood the difficulties that they encountered at the time. There was dark forces at work. The Vatican was the leader of all the dark forces which it was trying to organise into an anti-Jewish and anti-Zionist campaign, assuming the dimensions of the Dreyfus case, 
which had been behind the beginning of Herzl's work in the first place. And in the succeeding years, disharmony and distrust took place between Jew and Arab and the British government, who had perhaps lost the dedication of an earlier generation, such as people like Churchill, who understood something of the Bible. East of the Jordan River, Transjordan was created, and Arab and Jew rioted in the 20s and 30s through that difficult period. As Hitler came on the scene, and ultimately that dreadful Kristallnacht, the night of broken glass, took place when 267 synagogues were burned, 100 Jews were killed, and 7,500 Jewish shops were smashed. It was just the beginning of the horrors that awaited the Jews in Europe. British leaders like Sir Neville Chamberlain appealed to the cabinet for support that there might be a transport of Jewish children out of the lands where they were under persecution to safe havens in Britain. And indeed, Christadelphians were involved in giving these children safe harbour in this country. Brother Alan Overton, it is written of him that as a practising Christadelphian, he had striven tirelessly, even prior to the occupation of Czechoslovakia, to convince the British government that Jews in occupied territories were in great danger and that something must be done to save the children. He lobbied Parliament to that end. And it's recorded that later, one of the children, of the many children who he took into his home, that he brought down from the loft his proudest possession, a cardboard box with over 200 labels, name tags that the children had worn round their necks when they arrived in England and came into his care. In April 1940, Elpis Lodge opened in Birmingham, supported by Christadelphians in Birmingham and Coventry, as a home for Jewish boys. It was run by a Jewish rabbi, a doctor, and Mrs. Hirsch, and there was shorthand lessons given by a Mr. L.G. Sergeant of Birmingham. Meanwhile, in Europe, the horrors of the Nazi persecution continued, and the world could see the effect of Hitler's terrible policy. Ships, it is sad to record, such as Exodus, returning to their land were turned away even under British rule. And it took the work of someone tough, a soldier like David Ben-Gurion, to take the nation forward. Not a diplomat, but a tough soldier. Towards the end of the war, then, gangs like the Stern and the Ergen assassinated mandate officials and made Britain's position increasingly difficult. Ernest Bevin, who became the uh, Prime Minister in 1945, received a letter from another prominent Christadelphian. Brother John Carter wrote to him, if you read chapter 38 of Ezekiel, you will see that the setting in language cannot be mistaken. The British Commonwealth of Nations is indicated as befriending the Jew in the land where they were formerly planted by God and to which they are to return. And interestingly, at the very same time that the Christadelphians were writing such things, other things were being written too. As you see here, the apostolic delegate to the United States wrote, It is true that at one time Palestine was inhabited by the Hebrew race, but there is no axiom in history to substantiate the necessity of a people returning to a country they left 19 centuries before. If a Hebrew home is desired, it would not be too difficult to find a more fitting territory than Palestine. After all, those debates had only been ended in about 1904, when Herzl had passed off the scene. Britain compromised with the Arabs, and in 1946, the Ergen blew up the King David Hotel. Harsh weather in the UK, perhaps combined with the need for oil, meant that on the 2nd of April 1947, Britain decided to give the mandate back to the United Nations. And that body voted in such a way that it left a vacuum for the Zionists to declare their own state. And so it was that on the 14th of May, the state of Israel was proclaimed. 
as an independent nation, now back in their own land. Yet, said the song, is our hope not lost. The ancient hope to dwell in the land of our fathers, in the city where David encamped. And that national anthem, the Hatikvah, the hope, was penned by none other than the secretary to Lawrence Oliphant, of whom we read earlier. And so this remarkable story, which we have followed, of God's promises, of what brethren and sisters understood and expected to happen, they have seen fulfilled before their very eyes. And it leaves us just to pull a few threads together. The most obvious of which I suppose is when we reflect on the excitement and the dedication of the people who waited to start with when it seemed one of the most unlikely things that a nation that was to all intents and purposes scattered to the four corners should be returned and gathered to their own land under a nation that might return them and protect them and the love and the commitment and the excitement shown by the brothers and sisters gives us cause for thought, doesn't it, as we examine our own lives. Is our excitement the same as we see God's purpose being worked out before our eyes? Is our love for God's people and our hope in those same promises as strong? We need to think about the roles and the players. Brother Thomas foresaw that Britain would have a role to play. And indeed she did. And it is true that at later times, Britain did not act always in favour. But that does not mean that the earlier role and the early work that Britain did was not a fulfilment of God's prophecy. And it does not mean that Britain and the Tarshish allies will not again be involved in returning Jews to the land. When that second half of the return, those referred to as Joseph and Ephraim, will return to their land. And finally, and perhaps most importantly of all, what preparations are we each making in our own lives for the return of our Lord, for the fulfilment of that hope? Our brothers and sisters expected the Lord to come in their day, and he did not. But the Lord will come. There is to be a generation to whom the Lord will return who will not have fallen on sleep. And in God's mercy, may it be us as we see the signs unfolding and as we shall hear. And when he returns, may it be said that this is our God. We have waited for him and he will save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him. We will be glad and rejoice in his salvation. May we be there with him. And with all those of like precious faith, to see that hope of Israel it's receive its fulfilment in the kingdom of God. Thank you, Brother Nicholas. We most certainly have a wonderful hope and a wonderful heritage, brothers and sisters. We will bring this session to a conclusion through hymn 311. This isn't printed on your program, but we will sing hymn 311 before we break for refreshments. Blow ye the trumpet, blow the joyful welcome sound. Let scattered Israel know to earth's remotest bound the year of Jubilee has come. Return, O exiled Israel home. Hymn 311.
seated. So we have a break now until 2.45 p.m. If you go through the doors directly at the back of the hall, there'll be um, drinks and refreshments there. So please be back in your seats five minutes before. Thank you.